I'm colorblind. I can't differentiate beautiful colors that the average person can see. Red and green look identical to me. I can't see the red color in roses, nor the different colors of balloons. It's the same when I visit a forest. I know I'll never see the different shades of green in the foliage. But do the colors in a forest represent all of nature's beauty? Are you unable to see the intrinsic beauty of a forest? Are you forest blind? Forest blind? I have no idea what, no, I don't know what that is. No one's ever heard of the term forest blind. But that's not surprising. Because it isn't in the dictionary, nor can it be found in any textbook. Let's define forest blindness like we do the following terms. Computer illiterate is a person who cannot use a computer. You're illiterate if you cannot read or write. Forest blind, a person without the knowledge or unable to see the true value of a forest. Well, in that case, are there really people who are forest blind? Yes, there are many people. There are many people who don't know the value of the forest. The forest is really different from the forest. The forest is really different from the forest. The forest is not the same as the forest. The forest is 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 the forest. 숲의 특성과 가치를 모르는 사람. Being forest blind is an affliction in which people do not understand the value of a forest. But it sounds a bit strange. Most of us think that we appreciate forests and the value they have in our society. But the intrinsic value of a forest is not the same as our definition of its value. We shall meet people afflicted with forest blindness and hear what they have to say in their defense. How about taking a moment to contemplate whether or not you are forest blind? Palawan, Philippines. In 2015, CNN declared Palawan the most beautiful island in the world. The island is considered a hidden gem of the Philippines and a paradise for wildlife. But it is the mangrove forest that has made Palawan an idyllic paradise. A mangrove is a unique tropical tree. It is able to grow submerged in a coastal waters and also plays an important role in the ocean system. It provides nutrients and shelter to fish. Local people also benefit from the mangrove trees. Fishermen can catch shrimps that are found among the mangroves. Selling shrimps is a lucrative business for the Filipino people. And it has raised the standard of living among Filipino fishermen. For me, these are life. Okay, in, in, in this kind of business, we have earned money. I can help many people. 
without this, I don't know where we, where we, how can we live here? As their living standards improved, the people wanted to increase their income. They were not satisfied with harvesting wild shrimp from the mangrove forest. To make more money, the locals began to farm shrimp. These are shrimp farms in Manila Bay. This area appears to be open sea, but it once was a mangrove forest area. If it weren't for the few mangrove trees that still remain today, one would be hard pressed to believe that mangroves once grew here. The local fishermen have gotten rid of the mangrove trees and replaced them with shrimp farms. Boosting their income was more important than the forest. There was a boom in shrimp industry in Hagunoy. That's why every fish pond operator have an idea to expand their belongings. They just decided to uproot it by machines just to expand their operation. Some felt guilty about cutting the trees, but they justified it as an unavoidable matter and most believed that the mangroves would grow back over time. More shrimp farms have sprung around the bay. Here in Cheongju, Korea, a flock of birds appear at a middle school. They are herons, in Korea, herons are considered harbingers of good fortune. At first, the students and parents were delighted with having these birds nesting close. But not too long after their stay, the birds became a problem. As the number of herons sharply increased, some issues began to emerge. The noise made by the herons was loud and disruptive, and the odor from the heron droppings created unsanitary conditions. What made matters worse was herons roosting close to the school cafeteria. The cafeteria windows became covered with heron droppings and feathers. Even on hot summer days, the cafeteria windows had to remain closed. Fed up school parents started to protest. <laughs> The parents have decided to keep their children at home until the issue is resolved. Their demand is for the school to cut down the trees, which would destroy the heron habitat. It came down to protecting the health of the students at the cost of removing the heron habitat. It was impossible to save the habitat and also resolve the noise and unsanitary conditions. What did the school eventually decide to do? How did the lives of the Filipino fishermen change after expanding their shrimp farms? The boom in the shrimp farming industry did not last long. Mr. Castro has been operating his shrimp farm for four years. These days, he's considering closing his farm. On top of the rising labor costs and shrimp feed costs, the quality of the ocean water has degraded, which has impacted his farm. Si pagka hindi pinalitan ng tubig, eh mamamatay lahat ng alaga namin. Kasi dumadamag yung bacteria at yung virus, virus dun sa lupa. Kaya kailangan araw-araw palitan palit ng tubig. Malulugi kami lagi, puro lugi, lugi. Alam hindi kikita yung boss namin, alam pang babalik sa yung hulog namin mga isdang, ganyan. The water pollution in the bay has reached critical levels. The spread of viruses from dead shrimp and leftover feed has hurt the yield of the shrimp farms.
many shrimp farmers have left the bay altogether. Hired farmhands have also felt the pain. If they hadn't uprooted the mangrove trees, they could at least still have wild shrimp to harvest. But that option no longer exists. It's a punishment from God because uh, we must be the stewards of His uh, creation. But uh, in return, we cut those uh, trees. Just like that. We are not a good steward of God's creation. We are not. That wasn't the end of their tale of woe. In 2004, a tsunami hit several Southeast Asian nations. The damage was more severe than it should have been because many of the mangrove trees were cut down. A mangrove forest is a natural sea barrier only after the people were hit by a devastating tsunami did the locals realize how the mangrove could have protected them. Uh, let's say the intensity is um, five and uh, the tsunami or uh, wind surge in case of a typhoon comes in, it breaks the force of the uh, tsunami or the wave, which is caused by wind surges or whatever. So that is important to be able to secure the community from devastation of their homes and their lives. If the catastrophic tsunami event had never happened, the people would probably not appreciate the mangrove forest as much as they do now. Humans only realize the value of a forest once it's gone. The locals were perhaps afflicted by acute forest blindness. So how was the heron problems resolved by the school board? After three months of intense debates, a final decision was made. The school committee accepted the parents' demands and cut down 120 pine trees. A small forest that had been around for centuries was raised down in a day. It seemed that the heron problem was solved. But a new problem arose in the following summer. After the herons were forced to leave the middle school grounds, the heron flock began to roost in trees at a nearby apartment complex. Now the apartment residents had to deal with the heron problem. After the noise and feces became too much to endure, the residents made the same demands that the parents of the middle school made. Since the city approved the logging once before, they made the same demands to have the trees cut down. Giving in to the demands of the residents, the city has scheduled the culling of nearby trees. After this habitat is raised, the flock of herons will probably find a new place in the city to roost next year. And the same problem will arise if they settle down in a residential area. Cutting down the trees is a hasty solution that does not solve a recurring problem. But city officials claim that here, there's no solution except to cut the trees. After experiencing the consequences of their actions, the Filipino people have a newfound appreciation for the mangroves. They found a way to live in harmony with mangrove trees. 
the villagers living along Sabang River in Palawan stumbled upon a new cash cow to replace shrimp farming. They are tamilok mollusks. Tamiloks are found among mangrove trees. Harvesting them is a laborious task, and spotting them requires skills. They are sold at a high price. Rumors of Tamilok's natural benefits, which includes curing erectile dysfunction, have made the mollusk highly sought. Lasa po siya ng talaba that is like a uh, oyster. Then, kumukuha ako nito ayon sa mga matatanda pang palakas doon ng masin. Then, minsan, kumukuha kami nito, kumukuha ako para mayroon akong extra money, extra kita. While the men harvest hamilok, the women gather clams and crabs. Because the mangrove forest is situated on a tidal flat, many sea creatures live there. Some are eaten for food, and the rest are sold to the market. They live off the mangrove forest. Fish fund, it's only when people can get their money. But they have mangrove areas, all people are beneficiary. Not only me, not only you, so all of the people are beneficiary. Filipinos no longer cut down mangrove trees. In fact, they are now planting them. Planting a mangrove simply requires one to stick a mangrove seed into the ground. It's quite easy. And planting mangroves can also help boost tourism revenues. Tourists flock to see the thick mangrove forests. The Filipino people are slowly learning how to live harmoniously with mangroves. Bakaway paramihin tayo ay magtanim sa itlogang isda kona ng pagkain tamilok na masarap oy hipon na mailap Oy, maraming salamat kaibigan. Kayo ay laging welcome sa Bakawan. Susunod na taon babalik naman. Kami ay laging naghihintay. Salamat po. Mangrove forests are expanding. They're making a comeback and returning to their original size. Now that the locals realize the value of a forest, they appreciate what it brings to their community. You could say that they are being cured from their forest blindness. South Korea has undergone a remarkable economic transformation. The country's economic success story is hailed as the miracle of the Han River. The nation's forested areas are said to have created a green miracle. Many developing countries envy South Korea's twin miracles. South Korea's forest lands are a symbol of green revolution and have gained attention from abroad. However, Korea's history of forest conservation is quite sad. During the period of Japanese occupation, Korea's forests were heavily logged, and the remaining trees were then destroyed during the Civil War. Barren mountains stripped of all plant life were all that was left. 
the men and women of post-war Korea made the country green again through hard labor. They made these sacrifices to escape poverty. But they were also thinking about the role that trees play in nature. How do we perceive these forests today? Many seem to have forgotten the enormous effort it took to rebuild the nation's forest lands. I think all of the things are all right. The value of the present is more important than the future. People don't think about the future of the future. The value of the present is more important than the future of the future. The value of the future is more important than the future of the future. The value of the future is more important than the future. 미래에도 계속적으로 발휘되고 더 좋게 나타나야 된다라고 한다라면은 지금 그러한 부분에 대해서 생각할 수 있어야 되는 거죠. 근데 지금 숲맹, 숲을 잘 모르는 사람들은 그렇게 생각하지 않는 거죠. On August 8, 2016, there was an awareness campaign in Gwangwangmun Square. Volunteers spread awareness of Overshoot Day. It's a day that marks the time when we have exhausted our annual consumption of resources. The Earth has a limited supply of resources that it produces every year. Humans need to consume within the resource limit in order to achieve a sustainable way of life. So we need to use the limited resources we consume wisely by distributing them evenly throughout the 12 months. But the world population uses all the available resources by August. Then how can we get through the remaining four months of the year? We have to dip into future resources. This leaves future generations less to live with. 내년도에 뿌릴 씨앗을 지금 올해 그냥 먹는 그런 표현으로 할수 있고요. 또 돈으로 따지자 그러면은 이제 은행에 적금해 놓고 이자로 편안하게 생활하다가 이제는 이자를 떠나서 이제 원금을 저희가 사용하고 있는 표현이랄까요? 이제 여러분들한테 Tyler Ash, a TV personality in Korea, gives seminars about environmental conservation. In this lecture, he talked about certain aspects of Korea that he couldn't understand while living here. Tyler noticed that Korean people focus on the present and don't give much thought to the future. South Korea uses its annual resource capacity at a faster rate than other countries. Korea is continuing along an unsustainable path, but most Koreans don't realize this problem. 많은 한국 분들은 아직 그 전체를 잘 보지를 못하는 것 같아요. 자기가 그 전체의 일부라는 것을 잘못 느끼는 것 같고 어느 정도로 이제 이 환경 파괴나 이 환경 파괴에 대한 해결책에서 본인이 좀 떨어져 있다고 생각하는 게 있는 것 같은데 그게 좀 착각인 것 같아요. Humans form many social relations during their lives. Families, friends, peers and co-workers. We maintain these relationships by being considerate and cherishing one another. This is a natural part of life. And it applies to all generations. People are interconnected with trees from the past, present and future. Sadly, we only see the present state of the forest without realizing that it was planted centuries ago by our ancestors. It's not a resource that we can squander at will during our lifetime. Ize, 저희가 누리는 것보다는 저희 자식 세대가 아마 굉장히 결핍된 그런 생활이 될 가능성이 매우 큽니다. 이 노력은 지금 당장 시작을 해 하지 않으면은 저희 다음 세대들이 굉장히 피곤하고 어려워질 가능성이 확실합니다. Korea is a small coastal town in Sumatra, Indonesia. The town is relatively rich by Indonesian standards. 
How did this ordinary town become prosperous? It's thanks to this forest near the town. The locals are able to harvest a special product that comes from the trees. Damar resin. After cutting a hole in the tree's bark and waiting for a few weeks, the locals can harvest the colorless resin. The resin can be harvested all year round and provides a regular income. So the villagers endearingly call the Damar forest the golden forest. Ini damar A yang enggak ada kotorannya, kuning, damar mata kucing. Kita mau beli itu, pertamanya mau beli kebutuhan kita sehari-hari buat makan, terus buat anak sekolah, gitu. The resin produced from this village is pure and of high quality. 60% of the global supply for premium resin is produced here. Damar is used in many products. This same resin is used as a dye for batik, a traditional Indonesian cloth. And because Damar resin is widely used in a variety of goods, locals and producers can derive a steady income. Undoubtedly, resin is important to the livelihood of many locals. These Damar trees were planted about a hundred years ago. Back then, Indonesia had been a Dutch colony for a long period. Due to exploitation of the country's forest resources by the colonial power, there were hardly any trees left. But the town people of Cree decided to fix that. Even though it takes 50 years or more for a tree to start producing tamar resin, they plant them anyway for future generations. Oh, sangat senang sekali. Jadi kita sebenarnya berterima kasih sama nenek moyang. Itu yang pertama kali kan nenek moyang. Jadi nenek moyang itu nanam damar itu bukan buat dia, bukan buat anaknya, itu buat cucungnya. Jadi saya ini ngambil sekarang ini saya cucungnya. Nah, jadi kita berterima kasih benar sama nenek moyang kita dulu. Even on days when Mr. Rokian is not harvesting resin, he is busy with work. He collects damar resin saplings for the forest and puts them in pots. This is to ensure that they survive and flourish. Like his ancestors, he is planting trees to be used for future generations. And this is a tradition that villagers are carrying on. It's become an unwritten code that everyone in the village follows. Kami di Pamung ini, jadi tiap habis nikah, hajatan, harus nanam 10 pohon buat pengganti damar yang tumbang punya nenek moyang dulu. Oh, itu pohon damar warisan dari nenek moyang saya. Jadi itulah harus dipelihara dan dijaga sama kita. Oh, karena dari peninggalan leluhur saya kan dikasih 300 batang. Jadi saya harus menanam lebih dari 300 batang. Jadi yang udah saya tanam sekitar 500 batang. Itu buat anak cucung saya nanti. To the Cree villagers, the force connects their past, present and future. In addition, the forest will bring prosperity to the Cree for many years to come. What did their ancestors wish to leave as their legacy? It was probably much more than the trees. Perhaps they wished to keep the memories of these connections alive for generations to come. The Black Forest is the largest, densest forest land in Germany. It's the pride of the German people. The name Black Forest comes from how dark the forest looks during the day. For the last 300 years, the Black Forest has maintained a green landscape.
This is Mr. George. He's been planting and growing trees for the past 30 years. Today he needs to cut down trees for Christmas. He has to transplant 45,000 trees into pots so that they can be exported all over Europe. It's surprising to find out that he's the 19th generation tree grower in his family. For centuries, his family has been growing trees. The business was able to stay viable by dividing plots of trees into different sections. This is forest land circulation. In a grove, you'll find one-year-old tree samplings to mature trees that are nearly 100 years old. When trees are cut, additional trees are planted. This way, even though some trees are removed, the grove perpetually continues to exist. We müssen unsere Gesamtfläche aufteilen in kleinere Flächen, damit wir jedes Jahr wieder neu nachpflanzen können. Und wir Deutsche nennen das Nachhaltigkeit, damit wir also nicht jedes, damit wir jedes Jahr Bäume von aus dem Betrieb von dem Betrieb ernten können. Selective logging has allowed Germany's black forest to exist for over 300 years. Only specific trees are cut in selective logging. Mature trees are chosen to be cut to allow tree saplings to grow. Cutting certain trees will let sunlight shine on saplings giving them space to grow while keeping the grove healthy. There are several rules that must be observed when carrying out selective logging. First, the focus should be on planting a tree sapling. When a tree is cut down, a sapling must be planted to replace it. And when a tree is brought down, the angle of the saw is important. The logger has to be careful that the tree doesn't fall on other saplings when it's cut. This is for the sake of protecting the forest. Then the second rule is to enforce the tree quota for selective logging. No more than 5% of the trees in the forest can be cut down. Most of the forest lies on private property, and owners are allowed to cut down trees for sale. Raising the annual quota for selective logging could enrich the owners. But people do not exceed the quota. They follow their conscience in observing the quota. Es ist einfach so, man hat den Wald von seinen Vorfahren bekommen. Ich muss es immer wieder wiederholen. Und äh, man pflegt den Wald, solange man hier auf Erden ist. Da spielt das Geld nicht immer die wichtigste Rolle. Es geht auch darum, dass man den Wald bewirtschaftet, ordentlich bewirtschaftet, gut bewirtschaftet. Not only do individuals work towards a sustainable future, but the government also has sustainable policies in place. While there are many resellers in Germany's well-established wood industry, resellers will not purchase trees once the quota is met. It's an unwritten law in the industry that all Germans abide by to curb rampant logging. But historically, Germany did not always follow a sustainable growth model. During the country's early industrial revolution, fuel was needed in great supply. And wood was the only fuel Germany produced at the time. Trees were logged indiscriminately leading to severe deforestation. In those days, Germany was not thinking about the future. Da haben die Wälder so ausgesehen, dass die eigentlich keine Wälder mehr waren. Der Wald als Organismus war fast am also der Wald wurde komplett ausgeblutet und da hat, hat man dann festgestellt, der Organismus der stirbt jetzt ab, wenn wir nicht die, die äh, auf ihn aufpassen oder ihn etwas anders behandeln. Und da hat man dann dieses Gebot entwickelt. Germany is a powerhouse in forestry. 
Today, Germany's forests are on a sustainable growth path. Because Germans are careful not to commit the same mistakes they made in the past. This tradition continues to this day. They see the intrinsic value of a forest to be important to their future. Futurist Jürgen Randers asserts that a better future does not come easily. He explains that sacrifices, along with efforts, have to be made today to create a better tomorrow. Success depends on future generations upholding justice. Most people don't think this is a real problem. And secondly, those people who think it is a real problem uh, are not willing to make a sacrifice today, you know, pay today in order to get uh, a much better world for their children and grandchildren. The, this is very sad and it is very surprising. So the only thing we can do is to continue to try to convince people that it is their moral duty to do this. You know, they should do this. Although they don't want to do it, they should do it. How should we approach forests? A small Indonesian village offers some helpful solutions to this question. In this traditional village called Kasepuan, the people, who are led by a young chief, live in a close-knit community. They live a simple life where they worship nature and follow their ancestors' legacy. The people farm the land together and eat and sleep under the same roof. It is a large communal village. Arti kasepuhan, kita hidup jangan sampai meninggalkan apa yang menjadi tata cara uh, kita dari zaman dulu sampai sekarang. Itu yang di uh, apa turunkan oleh leluhur kita. One of the peculiar traditions they follow is the way they farm their rice paddies. Indonesia has a climate that allows for three seasons of rice planting a year, but for some reason their ancestors taught them to plant for only two seasons per year. Why forego the chance to plant two more seasons? Yang pertimbangan kedua adalah kita mempertimbangkan bumi atau tanah sebagai ibu. Seorang ibu cuma bisa melahirkan satu tahun sekali. Jadi setelah itu kita akan memberikan waktu untuk ibu beristirahat supaya bisa menghasilkan, supaya bisa ditanami kembali di tahun berikutnya. Villagers in Kasipuan treat rice with great care. Almost as if the rice is a living soul. They wrap rice in banana leaves and use the term to bathe rice when rinsing rice to cook. Rice is the staff of life that supports their livelihood. It is something that they would never trade for anything in the world. Seperti kayak anak, seperti kayak anak di, diambil gitu, di, digendong, nggak nggak jauh beda sama kayak anak kita sendiri gitu. They consider buying and selling rice a sin, akin to buying and selling people. So they grow only enough rice to meet their needs. When people are low on rice, they can help themselves to the village rice storage. While being very careful not to waste any rice, they generously share it with those in need. Ke depan, jadi kita hasil dari tan hasil tani kita sekarang kita membayar dulu utang yang tadi kepada tetangga. Kalau misalnya kita kekurangan. Karena secara aturan di sini tidak boleh dijual belikan. The villagers of Kasipuan need money too. But they earn it through other means. They sell homemade sugar. 
From the kong tree, they collect tree sap, which they boil to turn into sweet sugar. They earn money from selling this sugar to pay for bare necessities. Because the villagers live modestly and hardly waste anything, they are satisfied with their current lives. The restraint shown by the villagers is also displayed in how they manage their land. They divide a forest into three sections. Titipan means the god's forest. Duduban means the ancestors' forests. Kalaban is for ourselves. Kalaban is the only section of the forest they use. It's one third of the forest's total area. This is where they cultivate their rice paddies and grow other crops. They grow cassava, maize, and avocados on plots of land. One might think that they would want to expand their rice paddies, but the locals live within their means. This is how they follow the teachings of their ancestors. The part of the forest that belongs to their ancestors and deity is sacred and forbidden. Only the village head and ritual priests have permission to occasionally enter it. Before entering the forest, they must first carry out a rite. Only after they have asked for permission to enter from their ancestors, do they proceed to enter. Istilah di lubang sama, kang sama di manusia. Urang kudu sampurasun, kan ini kel ia putan kelu. Margina upami orang tu pupun tenan, bilih dilepatkan ku orang lubang. Bisi ayak nan santapan anak cek bahasa. Upami orang oge upami kabumi, namu pasti kudu nyebut assalamualaikum. Di lubang ge ubah benteng. One key reason that they respect this section of the forest is that the villagers know that they too will become ancestors one day. The teachings of preserving the forest and living together with nature in harmony is followed by these descendants. Masa mendatang yang kemudian itu harus tetap secara kontinu diturun temurunkan kepada generasi kita yang akan datang. Karena itu bagian dari yang kita sebut sumber kehidupan dan sumber penghidupan yang memberikan kita segalanya. They believe that the forest belongs to everyone in the village and not to one individual. The locals also recognize that the forest needs to be used for future generations and not only for them. So the choice they've made is to live harmoniously with the forest. Buat kami, kami selalu punya prinsip sedikit cukup, banyak nyisa atau berlebih. Jadi untuk apa hidup berlebihan karena itu juga tidak ada gunanya karena dengan kesederhanaan pun semuanya sudah cukup terpenuhi. Jadi uh, uang juga diperlukan, tapi bukan menjadi sesuatu yang terpenting. Uh, oleh sebab itu, kita hidup dalam kesederhanaan saja yang kita miliki. Rainfall comes to Kasipuan. Whenever it rains, Chief Ava has an important duty to accomplish. He prepares tree saplings to be planted. But the adults of the village don't plant them they hand the saplings to the children to plant. And these trees will grow together with the children. After the trees mature, they will benefit the children's future.
In Casipuan, trees are tied to the future prospects of the locals. The locals manage the forest land under a temporary stewardship and then pass on the mantle to the next generation. A life of restraint. A way of life that is future-oriented. This is putting into practice what we preach about saving trees. There's an old saying that goes, only see the tree and ignore the forest around it. Perhaps most of us cannot see the surrounding forest. We could be forest blind and not even know it. While ignoring the true value that forests bring into our lives, we judge forest lands with a twisted sense of bias and selfishness. What measures do we need to take or avoid to allow a peaceful coexistence between humans and forests? And what must we do to keep the legacy connecting the past, present, and future strong? If we strive to find a solution, we might eventually cure ourselves of forest blindness.